Hello, everyone. Welcome to Avaya's Overcoming PTSD Curriculum. I'm Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are teachers, mentors, and the co-owners of Avaya University. Avaya is the creator of over a thousand books, films, courses, teachings, and other supportive resources. Thank you so much for joining us. Our fellow teacher, Dr. Craig Wiener, is here with us to talk about tapping into resilience and post-traumatic growth. Dr. Wiener specializes in educating healthcare professionals and working safely and effectively with traumatized individuals. Individuals. He is the co-director of the EFT Tapping Training Institute and co-creator of the continuing education training series called Tapping Out of Trauma. As a very popular lecturer, mentor, and master trainer of practitioners as well as health professionals, he is profoundly interested in the underlying emotional connections that affect individuals who have experienced and are affected by trauma and adversity in their lives. He is the co-producer and director of the film The Science of Tapping, and he has contributed scientific articles and chapters to multiple peri per periodicals, excuse me, and books, and continues to maintain both a private practice as well as international teaching schedule. So welcome back, Craig. Thanks so much for being here. It's great to be here. I love being part of your program, Sandy. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, I'm so excited to, to reconnect with you. And, um, you know, we, we chatted a while back uh, as far as our overcoming chronic pain event goes. And, and you, trauma is such a big part of what you do, obviously, as everyone could probably notice by now. And, and I'm so glad that you said yes to, yes to this. So I guess let's get started with... Um, for people, viewers right now who are unfamiliar with EFT and tapping, could you just give us a little background on what those are and how they work? Sure. You know, it, it's fascinating because each year, one of these summits or each interview I give, it seems like a little bit more and a little bit more. It just keeps growing. I mean, it really began in the 80s. Tapping actually began before that. EFT or the Emotional Freedom Techniques was created by Gary Craig, but he stood on the shoulders of Roger Callahan and um, others before him. So EFT, um, especially what we call clinical EFT is the evidence-based style of emotional freedom techniques. There are certainly many types of modalities in history that have included percussive tapping. So tapping tends to be the generic term because part of what we're doing in EFT is tapping on different meridian endpoints that are near the surface of the skin. So many people simply use the word tapping to describe, but um, specifically the technique of emotional freedom techniques, and, and there are some others, what they do is they have several different elements. And the elements really have a bringing forth of the, um, the thinking, the thoughts, the beliefs, feelings, the felt sense in the body of what we're experiencing right now, or perhaps of a worry about the future, or perhaps um, a memory from the past. And it brings it forward into the mind right, where it's more malleable and can be um, flexible, in a sense, and adaptable. So when we tap on and stimulate and we create a response in the body that has a calming response, that has a relaxing response physiologically in our bodies, in our brain waves, etc., then the theories start to look at a counter conditioning starts to happen in which while we're saying these words, while we're having a mindful witnessing of what we're feeling while we're tuning into the somatic or body parts of what we're experiencing, that we can alter and change the way that we experience that which we're thinking about, that which we recall, that which we're tuned into. And so in that way, um, EFT can work very effectively with a really a wide variety of conditions that have to do with the stress response in the body. It's kind of, a, you know, I want to say, in a sense, we're rewiring our relationship to the stressful thing that we're putting our attention on. Mm, got it. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome overview. I appreciate that for people yeah. who are not unfamiliar with that. Um, so, okay. So given that what we're talking about today is obviously PTSD and helping people heal from that, um, in your line of work, is there any clinical evidence that has been reported for EFT specifically in its effectiveness for PTSD? Yeah, good question. And to be honest, there's probably more research evidence for the effectiveness of uh, EFT for PTSD than almost any other condition. Um, we have meta-analyses which basically look at the review of all the studies that are out there, and there are many um, with PTSD using EFT, so there's actually a significant body of evidence. Um, just to give you some ideas, um, 
it's actually shown. So when we look at clinical PTSD and we look at either they've been diagnosed or they use the uh, clinical guideline uh, checklist, a uh, PTSD checklist, et cetera, for symptomatology, we start to look at very high effect sizes. So for example, there was a, a meta-analysis that had a 2.96 effect size. What does that mean? It's numbers and statistics. But basically, when you look at typically the effect that something has, how effective it was, it's usually measured in a scale of zero to one, one being very effective. This review actually showed it to be 2.96, which mm -hmm. is very, very high. In 2018, there was um, clinical guidelines came out. And what, um, and that's actually, we'll talk more about that, but it really showed it to be incredibly cost effective. It showed results to happen in a much faster period of time, usually in an average of four to 10 sessions. Most guidelines, for example, um, for PTSD look like more like 12 to 18 sessions. So we see EFT being highly effective at reducing symptoms very quickly. We've seen it in studies, a lot of studies for um, working with veterans, um, combat veterans. We've seen studies for um, PTSD uh, families. So in other words, spouses that were affected by, for example, veterans that are suffering with PTSD and how that actually um, has an effect on the families and spouses and children as well. The really amazing things, we've seen studies that have shown um, an 86% to 90% reduction in symptoms within six sessions, six hour long sessions. Um, I spoke to one of the researchers with that study and he said, I almost wish that in that study the number were lower because when you start to hit numbers like that, it hits that unbelievable, not, you can't um, cognitively just accept numbers that high. Now, not all studies are that high, but we typically see somewhere between a 40 and 80% reduction in symptoms in an average of six, but six to 10 sessions in that range. So there's actually quite a large body of research supporting it. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. So here's just a quick question. Um, like what's the difference between PTSD and just trauma itself? Um, I, I, we were kind of chatting about this before we got started and, and I hear the word PTSD a lot these days. Um, but without being like officially diagnosed, I don't know what that means. So what are, what are your thoughts on like the difference sure. between the two? Yeah, now I'm not a psychologist, so I'm, I'm gonna draw information. My, um, my background actually is a doctor of chiropractic, but working in the field with physical trauma for decades and then moving into this work of more psycho-emotional trauma. Um, you have to realize that, for example, the DSM, the diagnostic manual, there are criteria. For example, you had to have had a trauma and you've had to add symptoms related to that trauma for at least one month. Um, you start to look at um, different signs and symptoms. You know, there's kind of a checklist of continually re-experiencing the event, like having intrusive thoughts that are related to the trauma. Those intrusive thoughts may be coming in through the nighttime, like as in nightmares or distressing dreams. Um, involuntary memories coming forward. It could be as far as flashbacks, um, dissociation or separation from oneself and one's feelings, feeling numb, um, being, for example, uh, having avoidance uh, behaviors to avoid anything that might remind you of it. You can have um, lots of arousal, which means you may not sleep or you feel like you're constantly on edge and constantly looking around you. You may have times that it cycles between, for example, being very aroused and then being totally numb and checked out. So, you know, there's um, a lot of different aspects to actually have a trauma. In other words, I just want to say to, to have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is different than trauma because trauma is at the heart of the diagnosis, but many people experience trauma but don't develop PTSD. Mm -hmm. So often that word is kind of bounced around a lot when people are meaning I'm having effects from the trauma, but it's not necessarily reaching that clinical level of PTSD. And I also want to make the distinction that when we experience a significant trauma, it is very typical to have post-traumatic stress, right? That that's very common and very normal, but given our history especially, is are we resilient enough to resolve and move forward, make meaning, have that dissipate within a month, or does it persist? Do we remain at that level of arousal, that post-traumatic stress that stays and remains and continues in the way that I was saying, 
and then requires because of lack of stability in one's life, it starts to affect one's relationships with spouse and family, ability to hold a job, ability to sleep, all of those things then start to move us into PTSD. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that distinction. I, I just anticipate a lot of people are coming to this event, obviously either having the diagnosis or, or having had trauma, but not necessarily being diagnosed. And I, I just want everybody to know that this event is for, for all of you, no matter what, because obviously these techniques are um, going to help with uh, those, Absolutely. you know. Yeah. Thank you. For, thank you for asking that. And, you know, to be honest, I don't know anybody that in their life hasn't experienced trauma. Now, that varies significantly. And in fact, it's interesting because recent studies have shown that um, sometimes PTSD comes from a single event, okay? However, when we start to look at, for example, especially in, in military culture, et cetera, the diagnosis may have been right after a singular event, but there is a tremendous preponderance of that there was previous trauma before that single event, often childhood, that then kind of primed the pump for which this singular event or witnessing or experiencing physically, et cetera, um, then sent it into PTSD, mm -hmm. right? So that's very common. So whenever you know, I speak with somebody about a diagnosis of PTSD, I don't think I've ever uh, spoken with anybody that didn't have, for example, earlier childhood trauma that in a sense wired their system that made it more vulnerable um, and less resilient to that more significant single impacted event. Mm -hmm. But if it happens, for example, in childhood, and we start to have recurrent, repeated trauma, and we start to move into something called complex PTSD, then we're starting to talk about um, really kind of a whole different bailiwick there. So like what, yeah, I've been, I've been talking with people about that, like the difference between those. So complex is like um, repeated kinds of traumas in your life, is that correct? Yeah, so there is a continual recurrence. It's not singular, and it's almost always, you know, so there's, com I guess if, you know, we can draw it into there is PTSD. There's, that could be from a singular event. There's complex PTSD. That's with a recurring situation. And then there's complex developmental, which means that it was recurring while the nervous system and body and brain were developing, childhood, et cetera. And so they're all PTSD, but they have a different impact because, you know, as the tree grows, so to speak, when you affect, if you bend a tree when it's young and it continues to grow in that direction, it has a greater significant effect on the whole of somebody's life and the way they experience the world and themselves than if it happened as a singular adult experience, which does not minimize in any way the adult trauma. It just, it, it sits differently in, in the way that the brain and body are wired. Mm, awesome. Thank you. That That's just brilliant and amazing to really get the connection in all the different ways, obviously, that we've had, you know, different experiences and how especially very interesting that, right, childhood trauma and repeated experiences from our past can prime the pump, like you said, to, um, yeah, developing PTSD. That's that's so interesting. So let's go back to, to EFT. So, so, you know, I guess probably a lot of people when they think of EFT might think of like self-help, right? This is something that they have heard about in the self-help um, world. So do you think that someone with PTSD who uses EFT can do this on their own, in their own home, by themselves, or do you think they need to only do this in some kind of professional setting? It's a really great and a really important question. So, and I'll try to give a nuanced and variable answer. So what, what, one of the beauties of EFT is that it can be used safely as a self-help method. You know, when we start to look at, for example, um, EFT versus CBT, EFT versus EMDR, EFT versus other techniques, one of the advantages that EFT has is self-application, which can be done on one's own. That being said, what is the focus and the capacity in which one is what somebody is working at? So, for example, you know, we're being interviewed during this whole COVID-19 pandemic, and we're doing a lot of teaching uh, with hospitals, school districts, and things like that. And we make sure that when we're teaching people self-application of EFT, it really is for self-regulation. The self-help part is not about working with the past traumatic memories. They're not skilled enough 
to be able to do that. And I'll also go into why they shouldn't as well. So I want to say if one is working on PTSD and PTSD symptoms, absolutely the person they should be working with a practitioner, a skilled practitioner, a certified practitioner, and depending on the dysfunction in their life and their stability, often a licensed certified skilled practitioner. Mm -hmm. Okay. That being said, even if somebody's working with somebody as a skilled practitioner, there are definitely ways that that practitioner can be teaching the person how to cause self-regulation when they're having a panic attack, when they wake up from a bad dream, when they find themselves hyperventilating or in a stress mode of getting headaches, et cetera. So there are ways that EFT can be used to self-regulate in the moment that absolutely can be appropriate. However, when working on the events, that are still causing, um, that are having an effect on one's life, those absolutely should be done with the safety of a skilled certified practitioner that can hold the safe place, that can hold a container, that can facilitate healing. The way that I always think about it is if all of a sudden somebody starts having a strong reaction, a flashback, an ab reaction, emotional flooding, that when working with a practitioner, the practitioner is like the person that's holding the lifeboat still. So when the person falls over into the water, because you know the waves just got really high, this person is holding that safe space so that they can come back in. And they're creating mm -hmm. that interpersonal neurobiology, um, the safety that's happening that Dr. Poor just talks about with the social engagement system that I can be that safe place that a person can come back in even after falling out. So there are definitely nuances, definitely things that can be done with self-help and self-regulation and other things that should not be and should be done with a practitioner. Mm -hmm. I feel obviously strongly about that. Yeah, thank you. I that's perfect. I love that. So um, obviously, everyone watching, you know, just tune into you and and what what you think is the best route for you as far as um, learning to do this on your own or or uh, you know seeking some help. Um, so what about like guidelines on how to apply EFT? Is there like a frequency level at which people should be doing this? Are there other kinds of you know, should they be doing it alone versus in a group? All, you know, all those different kinds of things. Yeah. So a few things are interesting. Even one of the, um, the systematic reviews encouraged that not only was EFT being done for PTSD with one-on-one, -on -one, but that it was actually very effective in a group setting as well. So done in an appropriate, safe, facilitated, skilled manner with somebody skilled leading the group, EFT can be done just as effectively one-on-one -on -one and in a group setting. Now, of course, it depends on the person and the circumstances. So that's one thing. We've got the guidelines that are saying, and even for example, the, in 2017, the US Veterans Administration found EFT to be a safe, effective, complementary modality for use with PTSD. We had a Kaiser recommendation for PTSD guidelines that said between six and 12 sessions. And most of the studies that are being done are, I'd say uh, many of them are once a week, for example, and many of the studies are one hour interventions. There are some that were 90 minutes, that were one or two that was held like over five day workshop kind of things, uh, experiential. But um, the guidelines and in my experience, most practitioners are working on a weekly basis. And again, in that five to 10 range to show highly effective clinical results. Um, does that mean it's the only way? No. Does more study need to be done comparing it, um, you know, to continue to study what is the most effective way? But that depends on the practitioner, on the individual situation of the person. But I would say that's typical and people should absolutely, if they're not seeing results or changes within six sessions, they really need to be considering what other kind of intervention needs to be happening here. Mm, got it. Awesome. Thank you. So what about like, you know, there's different kinds of obviously events that we, some of us have experienced and others haven't, like you take PTSD from obviously being um, a veteran, from being a soldier, those kinds of things to mm -hmm. sexual abuse, rape, childhood trauma, right? Physical abuse, you name it. Um, what, I guess, what are some of the different things that you see that affect people's lives who are, you know, struggling with this? You know, people, there might be some people watching right now that don't even know that some of the, the symptoms that they're experiencing are related to something like post-traumatic uh -huh. stress. Any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what do I want to say? I want to say a number of things. Um, first, people in general 
tend to minimize their traumas in my experience. Okay, they compare themselves to people that had it worse. Um, they think, well, you know, a lot of people have had it much worse than I have. Um, and, you know, when we look to traumatic moments in time, we see certain qualities. We see, if you look at the work of Dr. Scare, you look at several others, we look to what often are called um, Uden moments, so U-D-I-N. So in other words, something happened in my life that in the moment was unexpected and dramatic, okay? And in the moment, the experience of the person, if it was me, would be that even if there are people around me, I feel isolated and alone in the moment. Like there's nobody there to help me, it's just me. And all of a sudden this vortex happens. And in that moment, there's also an experience of a lack or no resources. And in other words, my first, if we look through the series of what happens in one of those traumatic moments, my first experience to try to resolve it, to get safe, because what's happened is my whole brain body has now shifted to a whole different type of memory, a whole different type of experience. My amygdala is on high alert. All of a sudden, it's about survival, right? And in that survival moment, there may not be a bear or a tiger. It might be being four years old and dad having that really angry face and coming at me, but he's still twice the size of me. So my experience as a child, for example, is can I appease first? Can I socially engage and make it better? And if that doesn't work on this whole neuroceptive below the level of awareness and consciousness and decision-making, what happens is I then see, can I fight this off? And if I don't have the equipment to fight this off, can I get out of here and flee? And if I'm not able to fight or flee, then I move into that freeze response in which I shut down. Part of me thinks it's over. My body starts to go into a numb response. I disconnect from my feelings so I don't have to feel the pain of it. And so all of these steps can happen very quickly. Now, that being said, does that experience happen when somebody comes at me with a knife? Does that happen during a sexual trauma or rape? Does that happen when all of a sudden the house is on fire? Does that happen during an earthquake? Does that happen during an accident? Of course, these are significant, what we call big T traumas. So, First, people can still minimize those because it wasn't worse as somebody else. But the, the little t traumas in life that still have prolonged lifelong effects are the ones, because we're often young, feel like I'm not going to survive this. Even though if somebody else was watching, they might say, well, it was just your dad was angry. It's like he wasn't going to hit you or anything. But my experience is I might not get through this. So my brain body wires in that moment of trauma and the thoughts, decisions, and beliefs about the world not being safe, about me not having what it takes to survive, about me not being strong enough, and all the different thoughts and beliefs and schemas that get created in a traumatic moment can have lifelong ramifications about my ability to step out in life, about what I can ask for, what I think I can do, what I can try. So while the big T traumas are significant, what are kind of called little t traumas, can have just as strong an impact and influence on one's life. So when we're using EFT, we're using it safely and gently, because that's key working with trauma, is always, you know, Suzanne Fadjil is my partner in the Tapping Out of Trauma course, and I love what she says, when working with somebody and when working with trauma, you only want to go as slow as the, um, so you want, only want to go as slow as basically as you can feel safe. Or you only want to go as fast as the slowest part of you feel safe. That's actually the better way to put it. So safely and gentleness when revisiting and working with trauma in these traumatic moments is so important. Whether you're using EFT, matrix re-imprinting, other, whatever somatic modality you're using, cognitive somatic modality, it's so important to do that. Yeah, so that's so key. And I so resonate with what you're saying about, right, the the whatever little t traumas um, and things that have happened to us that have wired us in certain ways to when we're adults act in certain ways, feel certain things that just seem so unrealistic and yet so real at the same time. Like I, like absolutely. It's just amazing um, how our bodies uh, store that and bring it into the future. So, so I'd love it. Let's talk a little bit about, I guess, like I want to instill hope for people. I want people to know that right amidst 
having uh, PTSD or any other kind of trauma, like that there, there's help for them. There's modalities. We've talked about EFT. Um, is there anything else you can say around how EFT or other kinds of tapping modalities can help relieve them from, you know, the pain they're experiencing? Yes. And I want to add one piece that I think will be helpful. So the interesting thing about trauma is um, what, you know, Bessel van der Kock and Freud and others um, have referred to as the compulsion to repeat or reenactment trauma. And so what I want to say, this, this is how I hold this on a, a kind of a spiritual context, is that when we experience trauma, and you can look for yourself, is when not resolved, not healed, it keeps repeating itself in various incarnations, right? So in other words, as a child that perhaps had trauma with an alcoholic parent, and they swore they would never be friends with or be in partnership with somebody else that had that concern, that issue. And yet somehow they end up with friends that are hiding it or a partner again. And we start to see this, um, it's just a fantastical, non-coincidental repetition of trauma that keeps getting recreated in our life. So on one hand, you know, you can look at that's terrible. On the other hand, it points to a pattern that can lead us back to where this started. So when dealt with an effective modality, EFT, matrix reprinting, other modalities, um, EMDR, et cetera, that when you start to look at healing the trauma, it's the, here's the way that I think of it. I think of it as like we're born in as this very whole being when we start, if you want to look at it on a soul level or however you want to see it. And then trauma happens and it limits us. It contains us. It says, you can't do that. You can't do that. Don't even try doing that. You'll never be able to do that. And the effect of that trauma limits our life. And there's some larger part of us that says, no, you're not this little being. You're this being. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep giving you the opportunity to resolve and heal that so you can re-remember that. That's kind of the, the model that I hold it. And you look at it like, oh, my God, not again. I can't believe this keeps happening to me. How can it keep happening to me? And so for me, when we can get to that place of being mindful or being aware or taking it as a challenge, it's like, okay, this keeps happening. I'm going to not keep looking this way and, and being just hit by it. I need to look at this and find out where this started and find whatever ways are going to work for me, whatever modalities to be able to heal this so that my higher self doesn't have to keep repeating that situation and keep bringing that situation to my life and it can move on. Um, so given that, if we see recurring patterns, we can either look at it as incredibly disappointing, as incredibly, um, you know, I, I want to choose the words well, is like that we're at the effect of it and it's happening to us, or we may be ready to say, okay, clearly there's something that needs attention here. And the amazing thing is once I watch and I see people start to heal that trauma, once they can start to hold it in their brain, body, beliefs, feelings, sensations, physiology a different way, once their brain waves can start to change in response to those triggers, et cetera, because the triggers may not be what we think they are. It's amazing, the associative memory we have. I can have an event and every spring I start feeling stressed again because the event happened in the spring and it's not that I consciously remember that. Mm -hmm. So as we start to heal that, life opens up. You know, our window of tolerance expands dramatically. Um, our resilience starts to be able to be overcome and be able to not respond defensively and, and in strong reaction emotionally to when those triggers happen around us. So, so I just look at um, somebody's life when we start to have a window of tolerance expand, be able to experience this and be okay. And then this and the relationship and what we're seeing on the news and what's happening physically doesn't mean I'm going to die. And so absolutely, I, I am, you know, I just want to say there is so much hope, especially with so many of the newer modalities that we're showing to be effective for working with PTSD. Please have hope. Even though you haven't maybe resolved it yet does not mean it can't happen. I see it all the time. Mm, I love it. Thank you. I love that. I so resonate with that on a personal level, you know, those cycles repeating and absolutely just, you got it right. Like 
it's not easy, but looking towards it and figuring out what that's, what it is and what we need to look at and what we need to, you know, start just, you know, paying attention to ourselves. And it's just, yeah, yeah so key. I love it. Thank you for you that. You know what? The, and what we were saying, we started off earlier and I just want to say on one hand, I once wrote an article about this of the, the light and dark of a diagnosis, right? And on one hand, the beauty of a, of a, of a correct diagnosis is like, oh my God, I'm not crazy, mm -hmm. right? This exists, it's not just me. And that can be really helpful in one's healing. And once given a diagnosis, it can also feel and be experienced like, this is forever, this is what I have. This is what everybody's saying is all can be done with it. It can't actually go away. It can't actually be cured. So I'm stuck with this forever. So, you know, I'm with each person. I want to be very sensitive that I'm ever discussing is the use of terminology, the use of diagnoses, even if a diagnosis exists, how much of part of their thinking about it does it become? And is it useful mm -hmm. or is it detrimental? So, you know, we're talking a lot of people here may not have been diagnosed with PTSD and trauma. Don't use the term PTSD if you've not been diagnosed. It actually starts to create a field of, then I'm like everybody else with PTSD and others with PTSD, lives might be far more affected. So um, I, I just want to address those that are listening that may have experienced trauma and, are, and have been affected by it and those that have PTSD, that it's an individual basis and whatever we can find that's effective and that makes us feel safe and that helps us to resource ourselves and move us on a healing journey. Um, that's unique to each person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful, Craig. Thank you for that. That's, that is so important. Um, labels are an interesting thing, just like you said, right? The, the light in the dark, the, the positive of, of it. Um, and at the same time, yeah, the negative side of, of labeling ourselves. Um, yeah, really important in our recovery. So Oh, this has just been amazing. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to make sure that you have a chance to talk about a couple things. I know you have a, a free gift for everybody as well as a, um, a program that you've created. So could you share about those? Sure. Yeah. I mean, a few things. So first, there's a free gift on um, basically a tapping guide, right? How to start to self-apply tapping in, in a reading beginning format. Um, recently, uh, People are obviously dealing with so much stress given the pandemic and are going through lots of stress and anxiety around and trauma around that. We're kind of living in that time. So we actually created um, a mini workshop. It's like a 90 minute uh, video for teaching and demonstrating how to be able to use it on yourself as a self-regulating technique during times of stress. And so people will have access to that. Um, there'll be a link there. If you're a healthcare professional or somebody wanting to learn more about EFT, then you know we have workshops and trainings at EFTTappingTraining.com. And if you've already done some EFT, um, we teach TappingOutOfTrauma.com. So lots of opportunities, but you can always email me, contact me, and I'm happy to find you referrals or resources, whatever I can do to help. Because I think feeling supported and connected and having resources is so important with us. Absolutely. Thank you, Craig. And, and everybody watching, there are buttons and links and all sorts of uh, things below us underneath this video. Um, so you can head over to Craig's site and, and take a look at all of that. And I highly recommend you you take your journey further with, with him. He's amazing. I, I can attest to it. We, <laughs> um, yeah. Are there any last insights? Anything else you want to share, Craig, before we hop off? Yeah. What I want to say is that Trauma is this um, word that helps finally give meaning and understanding um, for why we are the way we are. And, um, you know, Gabor Mate once said that you don't even, you know, when you wake up in the morning, the clothes that you choose to wear are influenced by the traumas that have happened to you. So the impact of trauma is everywhere. And the beauty of the last few years is that never has there been more awareness and more possibilities for working with as a culture that I'm just seeing for the idea of not just healing, but also the whole concept of post-traumatic growth. Because I don't know about you, but some of the people that I find most inspired in life, the seed of the inspiration for who they are and the avocation they found was born out of the trauma that they experienced earlier. Yep. So the post-traumatic growth and expansion for us as beings that can be born out of suffering and the traumas we experience is inspiring 
to me. But, you know, there's no race to that and there's no timeline to that. That's, that's a unique human journey. And I just want to give an end with that hope for that possibility of the transformation of trauma into that kind of personal evolution and growth is, is really possible. I see it every day. Mm, beautiful. Well, you've left me with the chills. So that was very inspiring. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for doing this. And it's just great to connect with you again. Um, and everyone, thank you so much. We wouldn't be doing this without you. So thank you so much for being here, for, mm. for loving yourself, for showing up for yourself today to, to learn about these healing strategies. And, and we'll see you again real soon. Take care. Thank you.